next up, our second pitch for today is Rodney Evans, um, who I am lucky to know, and he has a film called Vision Portraits, which he's going to pitch today. So well, welcome to the stage, Rodney Evans. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. Um, I am a Brooklyn-based filmmaker. First of all, I just want to thank Doc NYC for inviting me to participate in this program. I want to thank all the panelists for taking the time to come out and to, uh, to give feedback and advice. Um, I've been making films for about 20 years. I started out in documentary filmmaking, and um, for the past 15 years, I've been mostly focused on fiction features. I did a fiction feature called Brother to Brother, which dealt with the younger, rebellious generation during the Harlem Renaissance, which premiered at Sundance in 2004. And then I did a second fiction feature called The Happy Sad, which premiered at the IFC Center and uh, Sundance, Sundance, uh, Sundance Sunset Cinema in LA in 2013. Um, and both of those um, films were actually made um, with my uh, having been diagnosed with a degenerative eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa. So I have uh, no peripheral vision and very minimal night vision. And I found that as my um, filmmaking process continued, that became more of an issue. And I started to think more about how I would continue as a filmmaker um, uh, having been diagnosed with this condition. So that led me to my current documentary, which is called Vision Portraits. Um, and it follows me engaging with blind artists and uh, cutting edge scientists after being diagnosed with this degenerative eye condition. And the artists are a photographer named John Dugdale, a writer named Ryan Knighton, and a um, composer named Marcus Roberts. And um, the film really uh, follows them in, in, in depth and you look at their creative struggles. I would say all of my work really deals with artists and, and the creative process and the creative struggles of artists. And this is very specifically looking at um, blind artists and the ways in which they continue to make art in spite of um, the obvious obstacles that they face. And um, the film also deals with clinical trials um, looking at site restoration, so I am going to interview a gentleman named uh, Mark Humayan, who works at the Dohina, Doheny Eye Institute, and they do um, something called the artificial retina, um, uh, which gives uh, some vision back to, um, to blind individuals in terms of shadows and shapes, and they're doing a lot of clinical trials, so part of the film is going to be about uh, whether or not I am able to participate in one of their clinical trials, and that will be something that is followed, uh, sorry, over the course of the film and um, interwoven throughout the portrait. So my journey um, as a filmmaker, um, you know, dealing with this condition and um, going, potentially going through this clinical trial will be interwoven throughout the portraits and to create a cohesive whole to, um, to the film. And I should say that we're in very early production, so we're probably at the, the polar opposite end of um, where uh, for Akeem is. Um, I've been able to shoot um, what I can with a very small foundation grant and um, in-kind services from friends who have been willing to donate their time and shoot with me. Um, in uh, very limited time. So I've been able to spend a couple of days with uh, two of the subjects, John Dugdale and Ryan Knighton, and I'm seeking completion funds in order to continue shooting, to shoot with Marcus Roberts in Florida, and to uh, continue shooting the scientist out in Los Angeles, and to um, gauge whether or not I can participate within one of these clinical trials. So. It's very much a work in progress. It's very much uh, evolving as, as we speak. And so I'm seeking funds in order to be able to continue that filmmaking process. And the budget for the film is $250,000. So um, <clears throat> that being said, um, I would just, I guess, wrap up by saying, you know, the disabled community is 15% 15, 15 of the US population. And I think it's uh, probably one of the most underrepresented communities in terms of film, TV, and digital uh, 
uh, representation. And so this project hopes to speak to that underrepresentation of that community, looking at a group of uh, artists that are um, <clears throat> triumphing in spite of the obstacles of their disabilities. So with that in mind, uh, we can take a look at the teaser. Great, we're gonna have everyone exit the stage. Let's give a big round of applause for a great pitch. One thing I, I just neglected to mention that I did wanna say was that um, I am definitely looking for an experienced uh, New York-based producer to partner with on this project. I've been very much wearing um, a lot of different hats um, on this project, and so um, I'm definitely looking for a, a producing partner to help with the fundraising process and to guide the film through shooting and editing and then to completion. So I did want to mention that as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Lauren Limbo, I'd like to go to you first because we didn't get a chance to talk to you last time. Uh, what are your thoughts, questions on the, on the project? Um, yes. Uh, good morning, Rodney. I'm actually a little familiar with the project as well. I've seen it as it progresses over time. Um, <clears throat> my thoughts on your um, sort of spoken pitch uh, was I kept hearing you say that you are going to be interviewing people. Um, so I just heard interview and interview and interview, which then made me um, sort of the question in my mind was like, well, what what is going to sustain this film? Is it just going to be interviews? And then it made me, as you talked about the creative struggle and the process and your um, your interest in the artist process, it made me really sort of crave in your pitch to hear about the visual language of the film um, because of the emphasis that you were putting on you know that that piece of you know the the kind of the creative process and the creative struggle and then also you know contrasted with you repeating interview 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 it made me um, really um, want to hear about well you know what how what is going to be the visual language of the film what are we going to see and how are you um, achieving that or how are you working towards that how are you collaborating you know with your partners like I wanted to know about that stuff and I don't necessarily always want that much detail but given the story the subject matter yourself your emphasis on the creative process it it arose for me as something that I wanted to hear you talk about a bit um, that's my main thought about um, the pitch and then in terms of your sample um, really two things two things um, that I'd like to say. Uh, one is that um, the artists that you go and follow and, and you speak with um, in many ways come off as they figured it out already, um, whereas you are trying to figure it out and I'm much more interested in your story. Um, I think you know these folks have really insightful things to say. I loved you know hearing um, the one artist say, you know, blindness is a point of view. On the, you know, there's insights that are, I think, valuable, but certainly not compelling enough to sustain the film. Um, and in this current sample, you see more of them than you do of you. Whereas I think the real journey is with you, because again, they're they at least I don't know if this is true, but at least in the way that they speak and present here they do come across as, you know, I struggled with this thing in the past, and now I've arrived at some sense of, you know, resolution, um, whereas that's not the case for you. So that's kind of the bigger note about your sample, and then a really small note, um, the very beginning of the piece, I wanted it to kind of settle a little bit before you go into the train station scene, because there's some, like, nice poetry there, and I'm hearing you, I'm kind of, you know, getting into the story, um, and you know, it just felt like that very, very first scene ends too abruptly um, before we go into the train station. That's a small like editing thing, but. Right. Ronnie, any quick response on yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that you know, um, <clears throat> I see the film as as you know, following as as a much more verite film than what is uh, presented due to the limitations of what I've been able to shoot due to a lack of funding. And so, you know, it is much more interview based now than it will be. And I do think the film will be much more about their creative process and about watching their creative process unfold. John is going to be having um, an upcoming show in Hudson. So I will be following him 
preparing his photos for that exhibit and what takes place at the exhibit, the kind of work that he will be exhibiting um, at that show. And so he basically had a, a sliver of sight left in his left eye, which um, allowed him to continue making work. And, and that that is now gone, and so now he's completely blind, and it's a different body of work that's coming out from that. And um, and then Ryan very much has um, goes on a lot of travel assignments, and so he has very keen and acute um, uh, other sensory uh, perceptions due to his blindness. And I think a lot of that is um, the source of his travel writing. And so I would be following him on those kinds of expeditions where he's you know, going out with Scottish fishermen who fish with their feet and describing really acutely how that process takes place and with this extra sensory perception due to his blindness where other perceptions have become more heightened due to that. So I don't, I mean, I don't think that they have it all figured out. I think it's a daily struggle and I think because I've been able to raise such minimal funds, I've had to lean on the interviews that I've been able to shoot and what I've been able to shoot with friends that are doing me favors to, um, to get the project up and running. And so hopefully there will be funders that would step up and allow me to continue shooting and so that the viewer can experience more of their daily struggles and their life and and their work process. Uh, yeah. Just, just one last thing. I just, I hear you totally. Yeah. Um, it's like the constant chicken and egg scenario, and that's why there's chicken and egg pictures. Um, we all know that struggle, um, and so I hear you loud and clear. I just want to leave a thought with you that you perhaps might be very interested in the artists, and for me as an audience member, I am interested in you yeah. mm -hmm. from your pitch and your sample, and so I think there might be a little bit of a tension there May, maybe or may not, but just want to leave you with that thought. Okay. Elaine? Well, that's, that's, that's a lot of what I was going to say. And I, I think it's um, certainly a very brave thing to um, experience this and then go into making a film about it. And what I would hope, and it's certainly a process, but as you learn these things, how is it informing you and kind of your look on the world? And I think if... You know, it starts with you and your your diagnosis and then how you set out to find that. I would hope that's kind of part of the journey, that it's your journey, yeah. you know. And, and Julie from WNET. Um, so I, I, I think I kind of disagree with both of you only because you introduced the film as a film about artists and yourself. So I think your idea is that you're profiling two or three other artists not just your story. And, and so, and I, I have to say, I'm so blown away by the courage of you and the people that you are following because I, I'm not sure that I would, would manage to be that independent if I were blind. So I think having three stories or four stories, I think is, will be a stronger film because it's more than one person's experience. But I love that you're following artists and I love that you're following people who have overcome or have learned to live with a disability that is so daunting it's so daunting. Um, I would add to your pitch a little bit more of a description of how you see, because you are a director, and I would like to hear what it looks like when you look through the lens of a camera, because you're shooting and you're going to continue to shoot. So um, I, would, I would like to hear a little bit more about that. I think that your description of the film is a little bit scattered, but it's probably because you are so early in the process, and you have a lot of ideas and a lot of different um, tracks you want to follow. Um, I think you have to think about what you'll do if you don't get into one of these experimental um, programs for your, for your condition. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're dependent on that and it doesn't happen, you have to figure out where the, where the trajectory of the film is going to go. Yeah. Lucila, it's a chicken and egg scenario here. So chicken, chicken and egg, egg what was first. Thoughts. <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm also familiar with the project, and congratulations on seeing how it continues to evolve, Rodney. Um, and also, I, I like to point out that it's, uh, it's great that you're not limiting yourself. Like, you, you were a fiction right, uh, filmmaker, and now you're in documentary, you're a filmmaker, and you're finding what's the best way to tell the story. 
Uh, so it's in a way it's welcome back to the documentary, but at the same time, you're a filmmaker, so you don't need to be welcome back. Yeah. Um, and uh, I want to make a comment about your pitch uh, that I think it's important uh, to take into consideration. When you talk about disabled community and artists with disabilities, I would like to hear it sound more urgent because it's very important and it's very unique. There's not many films about this. There's a couple of films about blind artists or or people who live with blindness or with other disabilities, but, but what you're doing here is very unique and it comes from a personal place also, so I think that can be emphasized much more. And this is something that you're struggling with and that is part of your day-to-day -day life, so it's even more urgent and it's even um, more serious for you. So I wanna see that, that urgency in how you present it and then I think that could be part of the setup in the trailer as well. Because there's a good point about when we see the artists talking about how they deal with their disability, with their blindness, it's like they figured it out already. But I would like to see more of their, of their struggle because I'm sure, for instance, I'm sure that in their day to day when they wake up and make coffee for themselves, there's a certain routine they follow in how they walk around their place and how they're fine. So while they're talking, I would like to see something like that instead of them sitting down and talking. I think there's many ways of exploring it and also using their art in a more cinematic way in the film that I'm not seeing yet in your trailer and you've explained, you plan to, you, you, you plan to do that a little bit more, but if you're not using it yet, then explain a little bit more of that when you, when you present it. Um, and um, I write down, but without glasses, I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, so I perfect. Think <laughs> <laughs> I, I <prefer>. Exactly. <laughs> See, <laughs> <laughs> example. Uh, anyway, congratulations. This is a very important project, and you need to emphasize uh, why this is so important at this moment, right now. Yeah. We'll let you hold the paper up really close while we go to the next question, <laughs> and we can come back if, if you remember it. Uh, Daniel Chalfin, Naked Edge Films. What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, this personally comes at a very poignant moment for me. My my partner of 17 years has a degenerative eye disease and has just very recently been found declared legally blind. Um, so it's something that I've been contemplating and thinking about it. My two questions to you from a very filmic side, I mean, and I'm very happy to make some introductions for you to the, the disability community, particularly involved with blindness and, and media. Um, my, my first question, I personally don't, first person films don't resonate with me stylistically, mm -hmm. um, but I think a filmmaker can kind of earn the right to tell a first person film you obviously have that right because of your story and, and, and who you are, but it wasn't coming across to me in this material. Um, and so I'm curious if you are uh, using that as a device because you haven't yet worked out how to tell a story about blindness or if that is your intent was always a first person narrative. And my second question is, and I think for me this gets to the heart of the matter for a film like this and, and the unique um, ability you bring to, this, to the film, mm -hmm. which is how can you make a film that is accessible for the blind community and experiential for the seeing community? And I'd love to hear, hear you talk about those in a pitch and in general. Hey, Lucila, did you find your question with your glasses there? Just, yes, I just wanted to add one thing. I think that in the trailer, it's okay to use title cards. For many trailers, it's valid. So I would like to know a little bit more about the artist if, I don't know if this is a question to all of you, I don't know if you would agree, but if there is a title card about who is this artist or what's, what they do, something briefly, because it's in your pitch, but I would like to see it in the, in the trailers, just as information. But, yeah. Chris Clements, uh, what are your thoughts on the project? Because um, I, I, exactly, I, I think there are two tracks that give this structure, and one of them is like the moment-to-momentness of this, and I saw it in the film when, when the, you were walking in the train station and, and it hit somebody's foot, and that became like a very real contact, that's a real problem that you have to deal with each day, but I think in, with real concision, you could actually show the arc of, of what did these artists make when they had their vision, and how did it change? You know, whatever, if photographs, video, whatever they do, it must have changed. And it's not just because of what um, the limits that 
this is placing on them. It's how they're seeing the world. Their, their perception of the world is changing, and that's what makes it so compelling that they're artists. And I feel like if you could just give us you know, a few iterations of how that change went and then couple that with like what you were saying about uh, in the morning, the process of how to get themselves together. That's like you're going from a macro and a micro. And I think then you really got your arms around the, the nature of this thing that you're trying to document. Janet? Yeah, I just want to add to that. So I am really curious about the artists and um, I think it's important to create a visual style that shows the progression of their art. So they, they were, all the people that are going to be interviewed in your film are artists and then they have become blind. Is that, is that right? Yes, at different phases. Um, John lost his vision um, uh, due to CMV retinitis, which is an AIDS-related complication and, and through a stroke and uh, lost his vision at the height of the AIDS epidemic and was at St. Vincent's in the AIDS ward and lost his vision over the course of a year and a half. I mean, that's a story right there. Sure. <laughs> and then and Ryan uh, wrote a memoir called Cockeyed where he was diagnosed at 18 and was very much a, a punk rock teenager who was filled with uh, piss and vinegar and all of the emotions of an 18 year old and kind of was in denial that he had this condition and, um, you know, and very, uh, I think, s acutely and perceptively uh, documents what it was like coming of age um, and losing his sight um, over the course of about five to 10 years, um, diagnosed at 18. So I would add all this to your pitch because what you're describing about your characters did not come across in, sure. in the pitch at all. And those are really rich stories. Uh, and I think you know, if you're going to share their stories, your, your story is one of the stories showing the progression. So you know, what stage you're at, I don't know when you began documenting yourself and turning the camera on yourself, but if uh, each artist, if you, can, if you can have the progression and the arc of the film build through each of their stories, um, culminating in, in, you know, wherever you end up with your, your trial treatment or not. Um, but I do think it's important. I wanted to know more about the artists, and, and, and it was confusing. I didn't understand who they were and what they did. And we don't have to stop there, because we're out of time. I, said, um, I disagree with that, and you should think about not going to the artists' lives too much. Are you disagreeing? <laughs> Wait, Daniel. <laughs> we have, we're about to have a fight on stage now, uh, but we're going we're gonna to stop it from happening. Um, Rodney, you're very early stage, so you've got a lot of thoughts here about things to address in the trailer, and we understand where you're at. Uh, congratulations on a great pitch. Let's hear a big round of applause.